Hi guys, in this video we're going to talk about copulas, what they are, why we need them, and how to calculate them. Before we dive in, let's start with a common misconception. You might be tempted to think that given two marginal distributions and a correlation between them, we can uniquely determine the joint distribution. For example, if we have two identical marginal normal distributions and a correlation of 0.8, the joint distribution must look like this. But that's actually not true. We can build many different joint distributions that have exactly the same marginals and roughly the same correlation, yet look completely different. What we actually need to uniquely define the joint distribution is a copula function, which determines how the two marginals actually, well, couple. So copula is essentially a form of dependency structure that is more complete than a simple correlation. Before we jump into the math, let's understand why copulas are needed. By far the main usage is risk modeling. Correlation is blind to extremes. It only captures the average relationship across the entire joint distribution. But as we just saw, different regions of the distribution can behave very differently. Imagine two assets with an overall correlation of 0.8. In the center, during normal market conditions, the correlation might drop to 0.3. But in the tails, during crashes or booms, it can shoot up close to one. When markets move to extremes, they tend to move together. Coppolas let us capture that behavior, distinguishing between center and tails, so we can compute the joint risk of failure or any other dependency-driven outcome. And this isn't limited to finance. Coppolas are used in climate science, engineering, medicine, anywhere we need to model complex dependencies beyond the simple correlation. Now let's talk about the misuse of copulas. They were partially blamed for the 2007 to 2009 financial crisis. In fact, Wired Magazine ran a cover story calling it the secret formula that destroyed Wall Street. This is referring to a specific formula by one David Lee, which used, among other things, also a Gaussian copula. Now the copula wasn't the only component, but it was part of it, and specifically the Gaussian copula that assumes constant correlation. Lee didn't invent copulas, they'd been around for decades, but his model made them accessible for pricing complex financial products. His formula was elegant and simple compared to other methods, and it spread through Wall Street like wildfire, despite warnings from experts, including Lee himself, about its limitations. Ironically, the Gaussian copula was accused of two opposite sins. In 2005, it was said to overestimate correlations, causing big hedge fund losses when markets didn't crash together. Then in 2007, it was blamed for underestimating correlations when everything did crash together. The moral of the story is, don't blame the tool used for the job, blame the people who misused it. Before we derive the copula, let's make sure we're all on the same page about the CDF transformation, also known as the probability integral transformation. If a random variable x follows a distribution f, then when we transform x using its own CDF, that is compute f of x, the result follows a standard uniform distribution. Now this can be a bit confusing. The f's on both sides are not exactly the same. When we write x is distributed according to f, we mean x is drawn from a distribution which can be completely defined by the CDF function capital F. Whereas in the second part, we take this function and we use it to transform the variable. So the blue f is a distribution, and the green f is a transformation. Now what actually happens when we apply that transformation? Well, we could also apply the inverse transformation on both sides to get this. Remembering that since x has the f cdf, we can replace it with this. And we get this. And if this is the form of your cdf, then it means your random variable, f of x, distributes standard uniform. And it works in the other direction too. If we start with a standard uniform variable and apply the quantile function f inverse, the result follows the original distribution f. That's the fundamental idea of transforming arbitrary distributions to the uniform distribution that copulas build on. Now what we need to do is apply this to the joint CDF. And that's the essence of what is called Sklar's theorem. We remember that any x can be looked at as a quantile transformation of a standard uniform variable, and we get this. We then apply the f transformation on both sides, and we get this. Essentially what we've did is a simple variable transformation. The resulting function is called the copula function. 
That's it, that's simple. Take the CDF, transform the variables using the CDF and you're done. An example is worth a thousand explanations. So let's take Gumbel's bivariate logistic distribution, which he introduced in 1961, and is part of the Ali Mikhail Chak Kapla family. In the image, you can see the joint PDF, but the formula shown here is for the CDF. The first thing we need to do is to find the marginals. This is rather easy. We take each variable to infinity. So if we plug it in, we see that this term goes to zero and we are left with this, which we can also identify as the CDF of a standard logistic distribution. And likewise, we can find the other marginal. Next, we find the quantile functions by inverting the marginal functions. We get these terms over here. Now we simply plug in these terms into our joint CDF to get the Coppola function. When we plug them in, we see after some basic math, we get to this formula over here. And this is our Coppola function, the function that captures the structure between the two variables. Now that we have a Coppola, we need to distinguish between two worlds, the variable space and the Coppola space. In variable space, we work with the original random variables, say x1 and x2. The PDF looks like this surface, and the CDF looks like this. But when we move into Coppola space, we transform each variable using its own CDF. So now we're working with the U1 and U2, both confined to the 0, 1 range. In that space, we can visualize the Coppola function or the Coppola CDF and its derivative, the Coppola density or Coppola PDF. You'll sometimes notice sharp spikes along the edges of the Coppola density. That's because we've compressed the infinite tails of the distribution into the finite zero one interval. So for the bivariate logistic case, that long tail on the bottom left edge gets squashed, creating the steep ridge you see in the Coppola density. Now you might be wondering what's so special about the CDF transformation? Why do we use it to transform the variables to standard uniform and not some other transformation? The truth is, is that it's quite arbitrary. We could use other transformation, but it's kind of the convention. Transforming everything to standard uniform has become the natural baseline, and the structure you get is the core structure. It's also simple, and the transformation should always exist. Sure, you could develop alternative theories using different transformations. For example, the Pareto transformation that some researchers suggest, but that would require rebuilding the entire framework from scratch. One of the things we do get from using the CDF transformation is the relation between the joint PDF and the Coppola. We know that the PDF is just the derivative of the CDF, and in two dimensions, it's the double derivative. And if we follow the basic calculus, we get that this is equal to this. That is, the joint PDF is equal to the product of the Coppola density function and the marginal PDFs. The Coppola density is the double derivative of the Coppola. If we know any three of these quantities, the joint PDF, the two marginals, or the Coppola density, we can always find the fourth. So in the example we've derived before, we use the CDF, but we could have also used this equation and transformed the x's to the u's to find the Coppola density. Another important example is that of independent random variables. When the variables are independent, the joint CDF is equal to the product of the marginals, meaning that the Coppola function equals simply u1 times u2. For example, let's take a look at the product of standard gamble marginals. We can verify that the Coppola is indeed u1 times u2 by going through the same derivation as before. The Coppola density, the double derivative of this expression, is thus equal to one. Now that we understand what a Coppola is, let's return to the original animation and interpret what we're seeing. In all of these graphs, the marginals are the same. Both are standard Gaussians. What changes is the Coppola, which defines how the two variables are linked. In the first plot, we have the Gaussian Coppola, with balance dependence throughout. In the second, we switch to the T Coppola, which introduces stronger tail dependence. The variables are more tightly connected in the extremes than in the center. The third shows the Frank Coppola, which flips that pattern. Stronger dependence in the middle, weaker in the tails. Next, we have the Clayton Coppola that emphasizes lower tail dependence, capturing stronger association when both variables take small values. And finally, the Gumbel Coppola highlights upper tail dependence. 
The variables move together more when both are large. Of course, these are just a few examples. In theory, there are infinitely many possible coupleas, since any valid CDF on the 0, 1 squared domain defines a potential dependency structure. What couplers allow us to do is decouple the joint distribution into two parts, the marginals, which describe each variable individually, and the coupler, which captures how they are linked. This gives us complete flexibility. We can take a Gaussian coupla with Gaussian marginals, which is just the standard bivariate normal, or we can keep the same coupla, but change one marginal to an exponential, and get this. We can switch to a Gumbel coupla while keeping Gaussian marginals and then replace the marginals with different distributions. And we can go on and on, mix and match different marginals and coupleas. This massively expands the range of possible joint distributions we can model. We are no longer limited to a handful of predefined shapes. A distribution built by combining arbitrary marginals with a coupla is called a meta distribution. Okay, so all this theory was nice, but in reality what we have is data, and we want to model it. So how do we fit a model to the data? Before couplers, we had to estimate joint probability distributions directly, which is messy and rigid. What the decoupling of couplers allows us is to model the marginals separately than the dependence structure. So what we can do is first estimate the marginals of our data, either using inference or simply using the empirical CDF function. Then we transform to the coupler space, to what we call the pseudo-observations. These are the observations in the U space after we used the estimated F function. Then we estimate the coupler, the joint of these pseudo observations. We can try different coupler families, for example Gaussian, T, Clayton, Gumbel, Frank, etc., and fit each, that is, find the maximum likelihood estimator for their parameter. This is called maximum pseudo likelihood, since we're doing maximum likelihood on the pseudo observations. It's also known as canonical maximum likelihood. Finally, we compare models using AIC, BIC, or other goodness of fit criteria, and pick the one that best fit the data. I'll show a full example in a future video, but now I want to touch and clarify a few more theoretical concepts. We mentioned tail dependence, but the concept actually has a formal definition, shown here by these two formulas. The upper tail dependence measures the probability that one variable exceeds a high quantile given that the other variable also exceeds that same quantile as we take the limit of u to 1. The lower tail dependence does the same but for the lower end. It's the probability that one variable falls below a low quantile when the other does as u goes to 0. For example, the Gaussian coupla has zero tail dependence while the t coupla has non-zero tail dependence given by this expression, where f of t is the CDF of the standard t distribution. The Gumbel coupla shows upper tail dependence but no lower tail dependence. So tail dependence quantifies how strongly variables move together in the extremes, something correlation alone completely misses. In most standard couplers, the two variables are exchangeable, so each coupler has just one upper tail and one lower tail dependence coefficient. But in theory, this symmetry isn't required. We could have asymmetric tail dependence where the conditioning matters. There's a special link between couplers and other measures of dependence, specifically Kendall's tau and Spearman's row. Here I'll show Kendall's tau. Kendall's tau is a rank-based measure of correlation defined as the expected value of concordance, that is, the probability that two pairs of observations are ordered the same way. In simple terms, if one data point has a larger x than another and it also has a larger y, that pair is concordant. The relationship between Kendall's tau and the coupler function is given by this equation here. This makes sense intuitively, because Kendall's tau depends only on the coupler, not on the marginals. It measures pure dependence structure, which is exactly what the coupler represents. In some cases, there are analytical relationships that link Kendall's tau directly to the coupler parameter. For example, in the Gaussian or Gumbel couplers. So we can estimate the value of the coupler parameter theta by estimating tau from the data. But usually this is only used as the initial value for the parameter, and then we continue using maximum pseudo likelihood to get a better estimation. Similar relationships are also available for Spearman's row. Another interesting theoretical result is that couplers have lower and upper bounds. The upper bound corresponds to perfect positive dependence, when both variables move together exactly. 
In this case, the second variable is simply equal to the first. That is, u2 is equal to u1. The lower bounds represents perfect negative dependence, where the second variable is equal to the complement of the first variable. Any valid Coppola function has to lie between these two bounds. The bounds are relatively easy to find. For the lower bound, we remember from basic probability this equation, and we also remember that it has to be lower than 1. Rearranging and also remembering that probability has to be greater than 0, we get this. Plugging in the actual probabilities of the Coppola, we get this. And since the marginals of Coppolas are uniformly distributed, we get this. The upper bound is equal to this, and I leave the proof for the upper bound as homework for you guys. These bounds are known as the frechet hofding bounds. Now, why does this mean perfect positive or negative dependence? Let's show for the positive case. If we have a Coppola equal to the upper bound, we can see that the probability of u2 being greater than u1 can be expressed by this formula. Replacing the first term by the marginal probability and the second by the Coppola, we get that this is equal to zero. Likewise, we can show that the probability of u1 being greater than u2 is also equal to zero. So u1 must equal u2. And I leave the proof for the lower bound implying perfect negativity also as homework. We can actually use these bounds in practice when the marginals are known, but the Coppola is unknown. These bounds give us the range of all possible dependencies. This lets us quantify uncertainty in the dependence itself. Here is an animation showing how the upper and lower bounds look like, where between them lies the actual Coppola, in our case the bivariate logistic Coppola. The upper bound looks like the edge of a pyramid, a sharp ridge along the diagonal. The lower bound looks like a valley, a flat surface that starts to rise in the off-diagonal. Any realistic dependence structure must lie somewhere between these two bounds. I'll also leave a link in the description to a GeoGebra 3D graph that you can play with yourself. So far, we've looked at dependence between two variables, but what happens when we move to three or more? The dependence structure becomes complicated very quickly. Let's examine the 3D case. Using the chain rule, we can decompose the joint probability into conditional components. Then, applying the Coppola density formula to each joint term, we arrive at an expression like this. Notice that each C corresponds to a different Coppola function. Altogether, they define the full 3D Coppola density. So we can denote the 3D Coppola density by this. This was one decomposition, but there are actually more. Similar to how we can decompose the joint density in different ways, if we continue the derivation to Coppola's, we will get three different decompositions in the 3D case. But the numbers grow fast. In 4D we already have 24 different ways, in 5D 480, and it keeps escalating from there. Each decomposition is called a vine. All vines are regular vines, or R vines, but there are also two specific vines that have their own names. The drawable vine, or the D vine, is the vine that has the following chain-like structure. 1, 2, then 2, 3, etc. The canonical vine, or the C vine, is a vine that is centered around a central variable. In this case, the first variable. 1, 2, 1, 3, 1, 4, etc. In theory, all vines represent the same underlying joint distribution. But in practice, when we estimate from limited data and restrict the Coppola families, different vine structures can lead to different results. The topic is quite complex, but modern statistical libraries handle most of this automatically. Maybe we'll dive deeper into that in a future video. But that's all for now. See you in the next video.